All right, wonderful. All right, ladies and gentlemen, for our last presenter of Burn Corps Summer 2020 session, I'd love to introduce Dr. Laura Rosenberg. Dr. Rosenberg is a psychologist. She's been with us uh, quite a few years. Can you tell us how many? Oh gosh, I think um, September 1st will be 22 or 23 years. 22 or 23 time, years. Yes. Um, but this is just an incredible place to be, and a lot of it has to do with the great work that your department has done. Um, for these kids, I mean, we've certainly come a long way. Um, such an important part of what we do, uh, how we take care of our kids, is uh, their emotional well-being. And uh, so she's going to talk a little bit today about psychosocial issues of the burn patient. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's really nice to be here. I've worked with several of you on the ICU, so it's really nice to be able to talk a little bit about what we do. Um, so today we're going to talk about the psychosocial issues uh, burn survivors and families often experience. And the presentation is divided into the different sections. The admission crisis, the critical care phase, in-hospital recuperation, and the rehabilitation, post-discharge, and reintegration. So we're really gonna focus on assessment and interventions that we typically use. A little bit about our department. We have three licensed psychologists, myself, my twin sister, Marta, and Brent uh, Smith. And we're very hopeful that when we merge with Houston that we're gonna have an additional psychologist. We're really looking forward to that. And we do a lot of training. So we currently have two doctoral students that have been with us for a year. They're doctoral psychology interns. And right now we have one master level intern. But we also have uh, medical students that rotate through psychiatry at UTMB that um, every two to three weeks are come through and rotate and spend some time with us. So really, the nurses are extremely important when it comes to patients' emotional and psychological recovery. A lot of times you are the first ones to identify that there's a concern. So we really appreciate all the information that you give us. Please call us if you have any concerns about emotional, behavioral, social, psychological, cognitive, uh, concerns regarding the patient, treatment adherence, anything like that, please let us know. And this is very informal, so if you have any questions, just you know, stop and ask me, okay? So upon admission to the burn unit, the first thing that we do is a clinical interview to gather information about variables that are going to be helpful for the emotional and physical recovery of the child. Information about the burn injuries obtained, pre stressful events, risk factors, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about risk factors in a minute. Pre-burn physical and psychological health, coping, family and social support, the strengths and weaknesses. And these are very important variables to gather information so that we can develop an effective treatment plan. We also will gather information if there's a concern about suspected maltreatment and neglect. And the physicians and nurses are very instrumental in letting us know there's something wrong here. The story doesn't fit. The pattern of the burn does not fit. So it's really important that we get your feedback for any concerns that you may have. So we will evaluate for physical, sexual, emotional abuse and neglect. Those are the types of abuse that occur. And a study that was done in 2008 by Tomes examined demographic and injury characteristics of over 15,000 pediatric burn admissions to the ICU in the United States, I'm sorry, to the ER in the United States. And what they found was that children with burns from abuse tended to be younger, they had larger burns, they were more likely to have skull injuries, there was a greater risk of mortality, and they had longer hospital stay. These are some old statistics, but I think they're still really relevant. Of a million U.S. children who are neglected and abused, about 20% occurs through burns. That's a large number. And of those that occur through burns, 30% are suspected abuse and neglect, and about 10% are confirmed. And of the 10% that are confirmed, 50%, half of them, there's recurrent, recurrent ne neglect or abuse. So that's really concerning because if you have a child that's been injured once and then injured again, the risk for mortality increases, and that's very worrisome. So if the physician has a concern, 
about possible maltreatment, we'll do a different type of interview and we gather information from the staff, from the medical record, from the physician, from the nurses, but we want to know about demarcation of the injury. So for immersion burns, is it symmetrical? Is it circumferential? Are there minimal splash marks? Is it full thickness? Is the pattern of the burn consistent with the story? Is there a flexion burn? Do we, does it look like there's an electrical appliance? Is the location possible? History of the injury, are the, uh, the story, is it evasive? Are there contradictory explanations? Do we have a burn that's older? We've actually had situations where we have a child coming in with a new burn and then upon medical examination, the physicians will discover that there may be an older burn. So that's very worrisome. Um, is it attributed to the patient, a sibling, or a, a caregiver that's not around? And is it a dependent child, a child that's younger than two years of age, or a child that has special needs like spinal bifida? or cerebral palsy. What's the parent-child relationship like? Was there interrupted parent-child bonding? Are they young adolescent parents? Are there strained interactions? Is there lack of parental concern? Are there any other physical indications like bruises, hematomas, previous births? And what's going on with the family? Were parents abused as children? Are there limited disciplinary practices where they use punishment or excessive force? Is there a lack of support? If there's a history of mental illness or substance abuse, all of these can be red flags. And prior involvement with CPS or DHS. So abuse and neglect, if there's abuse and neglect, we do consult with UTMB. Your voice is very important. And we usually have the pediatrician that specializes in burns come and do a forensic evaluation when we have a concern. So this is an example of an iron burn. You can see the pattern of the appliance and you can see that it's pretty uh, relevant. This is an example of an immersion burn. You can see the symmetrical pattern um, and the child was immersed in water. And this is a child that was probably put in a, in a tub or a basin and the natural tendency is to pull back so that's why the back of the knees are spared. And here's another graphic of how that kind of happens. So anytime that you see a pattern like that, it's very worrisome. Any questions about possible abuse or neglect? Okay. So the first phase is the admission crisis. Patients and caregivers are really frightened, confused, they're in shock and disbelief and they're really afraid that their child is gonna die. So the physiological emergency is very relevant, but the psychological crisis has to be addressed. Family, family members are often traumatized. They feel helpless, they may feel guilty, they may feel blamed. A lot of our families that come from other countries, this is the first time they've left their country, their family, their social support. They may have financial concerns. There's a whole list of concerns that, that arise and they may have difficulty adapting to the hospital environment, and they may have different customs, traditions, beliefs, and there's a language barrier. So interventions that all of us can use are to help decrease anxiety and fear, is to assure the family that the team is composed of knowledgeable experts who will provide excellent care. A lot of times the message that they receive from the referring hospital is, your child is critically ill and may not survive. And when they come here and they hear, oh, your child is gonna do just fine, or yes, your child is very ill, but we're gonna do everything we can to help your child, it's such a sense of relief. Um, providing emotional support is very important. And this is where all staff begin to develop a therapeutic relationship with the family, and that is key. Literature has shown that the most important aspect of psychotherapy is developing a positive therapeutic relationship with a family. So it's important to provide education regarding the emotional and physical recovery process. For example, explaining to parents, your child may exhibit signs of cognitive, emotional, and behavioral regression. 
If your child is speaking, he may stop speaking. You know, those things are normal. We expect to see that in the ICU. And also, interventions that are very important at this time are pain and anxiety management and assessing the strengths and needs of the patient. And that's something that we rely heavily on the nurses for. In the second phase, which is a critical fair care phase, children continue to have intense medical and surgical needs, and organic factors may contribute to their recovery. So you may see some delirium, confusion, sleep disturbance. It's almost like their nights and days are reversed. They're awake all night and they're sleeping during the day. So helpful interventions are frequently orienting them to place and time, opening the shades during the day, placing comforting objects in the patient's view. You will see that oftentimes we will take stuffed animals to the room because they provide comfort. Or we find out what kind of toy does the child like. And sometimes if, if it's a young child and they like little cars or um, Legos, whatever it is, we might place those within their view or close to the bedside because it's very comforting. So it's really key to make the environment as soothing as possible. Visit from family and friends can also provide famili familiarity. I know right now with the COVID-19, that's per pretty difficult. However, sometimes we can have them communicate by phone. But I do want to caution, now with electronics and social media, it's very easy to say, here's the cell phone. And a lot of times, if they have facial burns, they haven't been prepared about what, to, what they're going to see when they look in the phone. And that can be really scary. So what we recommend to parents is it's OK to hear the voice of family members to provide comfort and reassurance. But let's try to avoid having them look at themselves until psychology is able to prepare them for the changes that have occurred so that they can adapt in a more positive way. It's helpful to provide the caregivers with information as to what to expect during this phase. So common concerns, as you all know, are pain, anxiety, delirium, trauma symptoms, mood, itch, grief and loss. And grief and loss can be of loved ones, home, changes in appearance, body image concerns. Even very young children will start to notice that their arms or hands look different, their legs look different, and, they, and they're scared, they're afraid their behavioral concerns, and their family dynamic issues. So here are some measures that we typically use to assess these areas. In terms of delirium, I wanted to spend a little more atten uh, time uh, on this topic and give it a little more attention. This is a Diagnostic Statistical Manual, 5th edition, and this, these are the criteria for delirium. There's a disturbance in attention and awareness. So a disturbance in attention means difficulty focusing, sustaining, or shifting your attention. Whereas an awareness is that they're not oriented to their environment and to their surroundings. So those are the two key components. Another key thing is that it's short period of time when this occurs. So there's a change from baseline to attention and awareness during the day, and it fluctuates. So there are moments where the child's going to be more alert and oriented, and moments where the child may be more confused. It's really important to determine if the disturbance in cognition, which can be memory, disorientation, language, visual, spatial, perception, is not due to a pre-existing or established or evolving neurocognitive disorder. So do not, this does not occur in the context of a child coming in that's in a coma. This is not something you're going to see, okay? And there, it's important to get evidence from history and the physical exam and lab findings as to what is causing the condition. A lot of times it could be sepsis. It could be so many different reasons. Any questions about what I've mentioned so far? Okay. So the faces you're familiar with, um, really what we typically will do is assess background pain, procedural pain, and also neuropathic pain. And then to assess fear, we use the fear thermometer, and you've seen the, this uh, measure in the room. And this is a scale for itch that was developed by Dr. Blakeney and Janet Marvin that used to work here. Dr. Blakeney was 
our director of psychology for many, many years, and Janet Marvin was the director of patient care services. And I think this is a pretty innovative tool for assessing the itch. Children can relate to it. Any questions so far? So also according to the DSM-5, acute stress disorder, what does that mean? What does that look like? And a lot of times we're gonna find that children will have symptoms of acute stress disorder, but they may not have the full diagnosis. But it doesn't mean that those symptoms don't need to be treated because the symptoms may be causing a lot of emotional distress. So first, there has to be a direct experience witnessing of a traumatic event and it caused intense fear and horror. And then there need to be nine or more symptoms in the following five categories. Intrusion will be like recurrent memories, intrusive thoughts, distressing dreams. And it doesn't have to be a dream about the burn incident, it can be any distressing dream. Um, dissociative reactions or flashbacks where they feel like they're reliving the moment. And they cause intense psychological distress. There's also negative moods, so there's a difficulty experiencing positive emotions. A child may look like they have a really flat affect, they don't really smile, they're kind of withdrawn. Dissociative symptoms or, or altered sense of reality. The best way to explain it is kind of looking like you're in a daze. Um, some people have dissociative amnesia and they don't remember important parts of the trauma. And then there are avoidance behaviors. They may want to avoid memories, thoughts, feelings, any external reminder that triggers a memory of the burn incident. So people, places, activities, and it varies from child to child. And the child will tell you. Sometimes it's a light flashing in the room. Sometimes it's something they see on TV. Sometimes things that we think might trigger uh, memories of the burn incident, they do fine with. It could be a movie. And for other, and other times, something that we don't think is going to really be a trigger can be a trigger. So if you ever have an experience where this happens, please just call us and let us know. And what you can do as nurses is reassure the child that in the current setting that they're safe. Help them become grounded to their environment. You're safe in this room. You're in your bed. Nothing bad is happening. And maybe putting some toys, comforting toys, having the caregiver go to the bedside. They need to know that. And then there's also symptoms of increased arousal. They may have sleep disturbance, may be very irritable, hypervigilant. And these symptoms occur for three days up to one month, and they cause clinically significant distress. So there have been studies that have looked at the prevalence of acute stress disorder in pediatric burn survivors, and really it ranges from about eight to 31%. Other researchers have looked at predictors of acute stress disorder or post-traumatic stress disorder in children, and they found that in older children, pain, separation anxiety, burn size, and dissociation were predictors. And in children under three years of age, pain, pulse rate, size of burn, and the parents' acute stress symptoms were predictors of trauma in the child. So if a parent's having difficulty coping and they're having a lot of trauma symptoms and they're not sleeping at night and they're very anxious and hypervigilant, that oftentimes is transmitted to the child. So the next phase is the in-hospital recuperation. Um, patients are becoming more physically and emotionally stronger in this phase. They begin to and understand the extent of their injury. They may have trouble here adapting to physical limitations, so they may not realize, I want to get out of bed, but I can't stand. And I can't walk by myself. Why can't I do that? They're really more aware of the changes in appearance, and they may feel apprehensive about the future. So we continue to work on the pain and anxiety management and trauma symptoms, grief and loss and body image concerns. And the, their psychotherapeutic work is accomplished with the patient and the family together. Families have to learn how to assist patients to adjust to the new situation, and the family system must accommodate as well. So a burn injury does not just affect the child, it affects the whole family system, with everybody needing to adapt. And the last two phases are really once they're off of the ICU. The rehabilitation post-discharge is transitioned to the outpatient setting, 
In some cases, children go home and they continue with their physical and psychosocial needs and therapy, and they have ongoing issues, like I mentioned, body image, uh, management of trauma symptoms, grief and loss, and we really start to work on social skills training. The reintegration phase is really when you're transitioning out to outpatient, and we're, the focus here is that we're going to help the child return to school, return to the community in a positive way. So there's a lot of work on social skills training in this area. Social support is very important as well. So in terms of interventions that we use, we use a developmental perspective. We will work with children based on where they are in their recovery and their age. So an intervention that you would use with a three or four year old, you would probably not use with an adolescent. Psychoeducation is key. It's important to talk to the patient and the family about emotional and behavioral reactions to trauma and what the recovery process looks like. In the early stages, there are a lot of supportive interventions. So we will really also work to identify ways that caretakers can comfort and help the child feel safe and secure. And this is where the nurses are crucial. Sometimes parents or caregivers are so afraid to go to the bedside and they don't know if they can stand by the bed, if they can touch their child, and it's important that you guys facilitate this and let them know it's okay to be at the bedside. Your child's head was not injured. You can stroke your child's head. If the child's hand wasn't injured, you can hold your child's hand because the child needs to feel that connection with his or her caregiver. For young children, we do a lot of play therapy and we do cognitive behavioral interventions. So we have uh, evidence-based treatments like trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy that we do with children to help them work on trauma. We do medical play and preoperative education, and we do a lot of this with child life. We work very closely with child life, and as well with the procedural support. We work on distress tolerance and adaptive coping. With adolescents, you, we do more psychoeducation, but we can really work on cognitive behavioral therapy, dialectical behavior therapy, mindfulness, motivational interviewing, and it really is a team approach. So like I mentioned, we work with Child Life, with music therapy, with the rehab specialist, with the nurses. Um, there was a patient that was very depressed that I worked with and had a lot of post-traumatic stress symptoms, and that person's expression of grief and loss and everything that person was going through was through art. So we did a lot of art therapy and the office, but I also worked with a music therapist with her, and she was able to really emote and express thoughts and feelings. So it was very powerful intervention. Another key component are the cultural issues. It's very important to have cultural sensitivity. Culture can be defined as socially transmitted expectations, beliefs, traditions, and behavioral patterns. It's influenced by country, ethnicity, sociodemographic background. Cultural sensitivity is willingness to learn about the cultural needs of patients and families, and it's important to incorporate this into the recovery process. So it may be helpful to ask if there's anything the team can do to meet the family's cultural, spiritual, or religious needs during the hospital stay. We tend to ask that in the clinical interview, but it's important to ask that periodically. So a long time ago, when I first started here, I had a family from another country that really believed that the incident, the burn incident was attributed to somebody giving that child the evil eye. And the child had to be re-hospitalized. The child was doing great on an outpatient basis, but had to be re-hospitalized for another surgery. And the medical staff were very alarmed. They said, oh, this child is severely depressed. This child is not doing well. We really need you to go speak to the child. Well, what it turned out was that the child thought that the person responsible for the burn incident, miles and miles and miles away, gave the evil eye. And that's why that person was on the ICU again and going to have another surgery. So we really talked about it and processed it. And because we had a very positive therapeutic relationship, I asked, well, what do you need for this, uh, for us to help you? 
what what do you need? What is it important for us to help you? And the person said, well, I need a witch doctor. I need, I need to have the evil eye removed. And I said, oh, okay. Well, I've had different requests, but I'll see what I can do. And the fact that I was willing to explore the possibility, not promising that I could deliver because I didn't really know where I was going to find somebody to do that or if that was allowed, that gave that patient the sense like, okay, this person really cares and is respecting my cultural beliefs. You know what? It's okay. I don't need it. I'm, I'm okay with the surgery and it, and it was a success. So it's really important to take into account, we are not gonna know about everybody's cultural background, but if we're willing to learn and we're sensitive to their needs, I think that's key and we communicate that. It's very, very important. Um, in terms of behavioral concerns, we really wanna find out what's causing the behavior. Is it pain, anxiety, fear? So we work with parents, especially parents of young kids on positive parenting skills through parent management training. This is based on social learning theory and operant conditioning. And it's aimed at reducing negative undesired behaviors, increasing desirable behaviors, identifying what are the antecedents and consequences of the behavior problems, developing realistic goals. So we may work on like daily schedules, routines, setting boundaries and limits key, 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 teaching parents how to provide immediate praise and positive reinforcement. Oftentimes, everything the child is not doing correctly is what's pointed out in our sessions. And it's very difficult to say, oh, you did such a good job with this and this and this and this. And so it's also aimed at improving communication. And this is also an evidence-based uh, therapeutic intervention. And we've used that a lot with our I'm not going to go over that. Grief is something that we spend a lot of time working on. It's not uncommon for burn survivors to experience multiple losses and need assistance with coping with loss and grief work. And grief is the emotional, cognitive, behavioral, and physiological reactions to loss. Grief reactions are unique, and complications can occur when there's grief and trauma on top of it. So psychological interventions are very helpful or providing emotional support to the patient and the families. We have a intervention called compassionate truth telling and I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. So that's something that we incorporate when we're gonna inform a child about an amputation or a death of a family member or multiple family members or a loss of a pet, uh, any loss. And during this process, it's important to have acceptance and respect for individual differences. We may feel that it, we need to proceed with compassionate truth telling right away because we need, the child is asking and we, the child needs an answer, but the caregiver may not be ready to proceed. So we have to help them get ready in order to, for the intervention to be more successful. And again, being sensitive to the cultural, religious, and spiritual needs. And nurses play an important, important part in grief work. I can't tell you how many times when we've been planning compassionate truth telling and we ask the caregivers, who would you like present? Well, of course, I want psychologists there. I may need clergy there, but I really want my nurse so-and-so there because that nurse has been there from the very beginning and my child responds very favorably. So we work with everybody to help prepare them for this process. So we've actually presented on this before at different conferences, and it involves multiple sessions with a caregiver. We develop a plan. Timing is crucial, when it's gonna occur and who's gonna be present. We incorporate cultural and spiritual needs. Oftentimes we use a story format and we select a language that's age appropriate. We acknowledge expression of feelings and we facilitate caregiver comforting the child. And we might also provide memory items or facilitate saying goodbye and always have a follow-up plan. Is it okay if I come back and see you this afternoon or tomorrow morning just to check to make sure you're doing okay? If there, a lot of times the barrier to proceeding with compassionate truth telling 
the caregiver is really concerned that hearing this news, whatever the news is of the loss, is going to negatively and adversely affect the child's recovery. And that's the main barrier. And sometimes we've even had to have a meeting with the attending physician and the nurse and the caregiver and the psychologist to discuss about how it's, it's okay to proceed. Sometimes they need that reassurance. Any questions about compassionate truth telling or grief? Okay. Resilience is a capability to adjust well when dealing with difficult situations. Exposure to trauma, a person's ability to cope is influenced by individual characteristics and social structures. So social support is very, very important. Emotionally, cognitively, it's really important. And the role of the family in the community is very important. And I think all these variables help children that seem to be very resilient. Um, body image is something that we spend a lot of time working on with the children and with the families. Children will, at a, at a young age and often very, like within a couple of weeks of their arrival, if they're able to speak and communicate, will say, I want to see myself in the mirror. Or, why does my arm look different? What's happening to me? So, there's been a lot of research that has been done on body image um, and burns. Um, body image is one self-evaluation of a person's physical appearance and it's highly correlated with self-esteem. It's assumed that negative body image is associated with psychiatric conditions, but not always. It is influenced by cultural norms and there have been diverse models that have been developed um, about what, const what, what uh, variables are important in terms of body image. So different variables that may influence body image include social, cultural, and individual. And actually, Cash has a book on body image, and there's some several chapters in there on burns. It's really good. And Thompson and Kent have done a lot of research as well. And John Lawrence did a lot of work in that, and Bauerbach as well. Um, social stigmatization is the process of being socially rejected based on negative stereotypes. So it's going out in public and not there's an absence of friendliness, people may be staring, pointing, making negative comments, there's avoidance behaviors. There's limited research on the relationship between body image dissatisfaction and perceived stigmatization. But what we have found out is that the, import, the important moderator is the importance of appearance. So if a person really perceives that their appearance is very, very important, they may feel that certain reactions are more due to their appearance, whereas somebody who doesn't perceive that their importance is as important, I'm, I didn't say that correctly, where somebody that doesn't perceive that their appearance is that important may not have the same perception. But it's an important variable. How important is appearance to that person? So we have several social integration programs that are really focused on facilitating reintegration post burn um, and they're influenced by cultural norms. So the first thing we do is we assess. What are their beliefs and attitudes about appearance? How important is appearance to you? Are you satisfied or dissatisfied? How have you coped with stigmatizing behaviors? Um, and what is a parent's child perception? Because a parent may perceive that there, there's a lot of difficulty, whereas the child thinks that they're doing fine and they're not having any problems. And there may be two different conflicting reports there. So before a child is discharged, we explore their concerns and fears. And we do a lot of this work in the outpatient setting. We talk about family acceptance, so we want to prepare parents, siblings, extended family members. And we talk about ways that the community may react and respond, like their neighbors, their friends, going to social gatherings, church. And we really work on strategies to cope with stigmatizing behaviors. So we do a lot of social skills training. We, do, we talk a lot about cognitive behavioral strategies. We rehearse responses to questions. And we role play different scenarios. And this is something that Child Life really helps us with because when they have outings, then we are, we are able to see if the children can actually use these skills 
in that setting. But a lot of times families will go out on the weekend, so they'll go to Walmart or they'll go to the beach. And then when they come back, they're able to talk about what their experience was and whether the strategies they used were helpful or not. So there's real life practice in the community. And the key is normalizing activities. It's important to go back to the community. It's important to go back to school. It's important to go back to work. And we also have ways of helping them get back. So some of the programs that have been developed specifically for burn survivors are beyond uh, surviving tools for thriving it used to be known as the best program and this is by Barbara Cameron Quill and the Phoenix Society and it's available in English and Spanish the, another program is changing faces reach out by James Partridge from the UK it's also available in English and Spanish the a great support group are the Phoenix Society for burn survivors and every Wednesday they have a chat group where burn survivors can log in and they are able to communicate with other burn survivors and talk about their experiences. And a lot of um, burn units have school education programs. So school reentry visit by an interdisciplinary team is often done. We here have done that. We've done individualized videos for children that live very far away or PowerPoint presentations. If we have a child, for example, from Mexico or South America or any other country will make an individualized video and we have several meetings with the parents and the child to discuss what they want to mention in the video, what's important to be mentioned in the video, and then we usually will film it in rehab. Um, rehab will talk about the rehab needs and the pressure garments and the mask and any physical limitations and the psychologist usually addresses the psychosocial needs and anything that the child wants or the family wants incorporated into the video. And then also there's a program by the Phoenix Society which is called the Journey Back and this is for people that don't have the ability to make an individualized video or do a school visit. There are several suggestions on how to help with school reentry there. And also another thing that's really important and I think Clayton probably talked about this are the burn camps. Uh, child life briefly mentioned it, and I didn't get to talk much about it at all, actually. Oh, I'm surprised. <laughs> <laughs> so but why would I talk about burn camps, Dr. Rosenberg? Because you have always gone and <laughs> promote burn camps, and you're... I'm the burn camp guru. You case. are the guru. <laughs> I was going to say that, yeah. So this is a great place for children to socialize, to have fun, but then some of them also, some of the camps also have specific psychosocial interventions to work on all these variables that we talked about. Um, any questions so far? No? We're good, okay. Social belongingness, I just want to kind of mention this. It's a basic core need that influences human behavior. Exclusion is due to, asp if, if it's due to aspects of one's appearance and function can be very difficult. The degree of belonging and self-esteem are related. So if a person feels that they belong, their self-esteem may increase. Like for example, you're invited to a party. Oh, I feel like I'm part of the group. I feel really good. However, if belonging declines, self-esteem may diminish. So they're excluded from activity. So social exclusion uh, can affect mood. It can either, if it's negative, it can affect mood. If it's positive, it can affect mood. So, and I think this is an area that we really need to do a lot more research in because I don't think this has been explored as much as it needs to. So when we're able to, maybe it's something we're gonna look at. And this is how we used to make videos way back when. They don't make them like that anymore. So that's my presentation for today. Any questions? Nothing? Okay. I know it's the end of the day and everybody's probably really tired. Well, I enjoyed uh, being able to present this information. Please call psychology if you have any concerns about the child's emotional, behavioral, cognitive functioning, or the caregiver. We're here to help. And just, if I can't emphasize enough how important the role of the nurses is um, in terms of the recovery. It's very, very important for the caregivers and for the children that you guys help treat.
All right, thank you very much, Dr. Very Rosenberg. Much. Just a wonderful presentation. And a great end to our burn course. Um, we, you guys see a lot, especially in the ICU. So, I mean, you know firsthand the tragedy of burn injury, how it affects not just the patient, but the family unit, that sense of loss, of uh, past life, and, you know, the new normal. But um, there is so much hope after what these children experience. And um, some even have a post-traumatic growth, which yes, that's the new that's the new area that we're really looking into, and actually Brent is really leading our research on that. But we're all going to be involved. So, what can happen that's positive after a traumatic experience? Basically, that's what we're looking at. And what are variables that promote growth? So I went through this horrible burn injury. I had amputation to both of my legs. I have felt depressed and hopeless. I'm having trauma symptoms. But then there's something inside of me that says, but I have a second opportunity. And now I'm closer with my family. And now I have goals, whereas before I maybe didn't have goals. And these are all the things I want to accomplish and I want to help people. That's an example. Right, it's like a new appreciation it's for life. It's a new life. appreciation. It's like what is positive that is coming out mm -hmm. of it, this experience. It is, it's incredible because you would think, right, like uh, the layman might think, well, these patients, these poor patients, you guys probably get all the time. How can you work in the burn unit? It's like, well, how could you not? I mean, the incredible stories of, you know, just overcoming adversity. And uh, that's something that our children experience, you know, even long after discharge. Um, and it's something that we get to nurture, you know, not just yeah. a psychologist level, but from the nurse's perspective as well. So listen to your patients. Uh, just you'll, you'll get so much warmth from them uh, and, and what they want to talk about and about their lives and the enrichment. And, uh, so it can be a very positive experience for, for everybody. And actually, if you have the opportunity ever to go like to the World Burn Congress, which is hosted by the Phoenix Society every year, there will be people that will speak about how their lives turned around for the better. And hearing their stories is really impressive. And it really, it's why we do what we do. It's why I've done this for so many years. I think it's really important. I think we have an impact in a very positive way. And we may not always realize how positive that is until they come back two or three years later and they want to hug and kiss you and they remember you. And you know, you, you see a thousand patients and they remember you. And I mean, it's just this like incredibly warm moment, um, social distance friendly, but <laughs> it's, uh, it, it's just something that's, that comes with time certainly, um, but, but how connected we are with our patients when we feel, oh, well, we're just here, I I interventions and treatments, it's so much more than that. You know, it's people helping people through adversity. It's just, just a cool thing to be a part of. Yeah. All right, any final thoughts? Thank it's you like guys for everything test. you do. No, that's it. All right, wonderful. Thank you so Thank much, you. Dr. Rosenberg. We sure appreciate you being our closer for a burn course. Thank you, good luck with, to all of you. <laughs> I'll see you later. <laughs> all right, bye. Thank bye. you so much. Have a good afternoon.